o mua, me o nainei, te whanau, me ngā hoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Given the discussions surrounding my resignation from Parliament, I have thought carefully about what is left to say in my valedictory statement. And while I will speak about the highlights and acknowledge those who made things happen, I want to also talk about my new role. But there are a few things that I also feel I need to address given comments that have been made over the last few days. When I was forced out of my electorate in 2020 by the unconstitutional actions of the party president, Claire Zabo, and some members of council, I was devastated. The President accepted a late nomination, did not share the fact of its late receipt with the Council until questions were asked, and then retrospectively tried to justify and legitimise her actions. But the devastation was not so much about the actions directed against me, but about the devastation wrought on my Manirua Labour Electric Committee when their voting rights were removed to ensure that a central party vote would prevail. I was lucky throughout my years as MP for Manurewa to have the staunch support of the LEC. My nomination for 2020 uh, was made by the Manurewa Local Electric Committee, and I had the support of my union, Air 2, and their members. The LEC that supported me was made up of a number of life members of the party, some of whom had served through the periods of the Honourable Roger Douglas and George Hawkins. And as I leave, I want to acknowledge my LEC members. A number are here today and those that have sent apologies. I especially want to acknowledge Raywyn Turner and her late husband, Trevor, and Andrew Byer, who all served on the executive of my LEC and to thank them for their continuous support. Further, I want to apologise to them for the actions of the party president and council members who disenfranchised them without any basis or explanation after years of loyalty. For me, people like Raywin, Trevor and Andrew and those who are here today are the foundation of Labour. The way they were treated in order to punish me is reprehensible and it is as a result of that corrupt process that I'm standing to deliver my valedictory statement today. And in recognition of that electorate role as MP for Manirua, I also want to acknowledge Bill Marshall and Verena Kingsley-Jones, who were my representatives on the ground in my Manirewa office from the time of my election in 2011 until the time of my deselection in 2020. In 2020, I agreed to leave because, irrespective of the merits of challenging certain actions, being in a team where there is no appetite for your contribution is not healthy. I took the opportunity to complete some of my ongoing work, including in the international advocacy space. I was placed on the list just below where I had been in 2017 and accepted that I was to resign as an MP during this term. And I want to record formally my gratitude to the Honourable Michael Wood, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta and Tim Barnett for their integrity in assisting in a process of reaching an agreement. And so I stand here today fulfilling my part of that agreement, but I want to be very clear that this was not entirely my choice. I have been a member of the Service and Food Workers Union, now ETU, since 1986, and joined the Avondale branch of the Labour Party on the 4th of March, 1998. At the time, Avondale was part of the Mount Albert LEC, supporting its MP, the Right Honourable Helen Clark. And I want to thank Helen and the LEC, particularly Joan Caulfield, for their support and having the confidence to begin my path to Parliament. And it is that confidence that was acknowledged by then Party President Moira Coatesworth when I became Manudewa's Labour candidate. Coincidentally, it was exactly 10 years later, on the 4th of March 2008, that I was first sworn into this House when Anne Hartley retired. I have enjoyed the privilege of being a member of this House since March 2008 for a period of eight months, and then from 2011 as the proud representative of Manurewa. 
I firmly believe that being a member of this House offers the opportunity to find solutions, to advocate and to do what we all say we want to do when we enter this House, and that is to make a difference. I have approached this role in the same way that I have faced all other challenges. I will look towards the try line or the goal and pursue the most direct path that will achieve the objective. To that end, I differ from some of my colleagues and those in leadership. Perhaps I am politically naive in that approach, but the time we have here can be short and it should not be wasted. I have learned that working across the House is the best way to make effective and long-lasting change. I have always been grateful to my colleagues and other parties who are willing to listen and are open to discuss issues. And I acknowledge that the engagement of colleagues on this side of the House has often been influenced by matters outside the issues. In my view, there is no place here for an us and them, them ment mentality. We need to be more kaupapa rather than personality driven. For me, the journey to marriage equality in Aotearoa, New Zealand, was a rapid fire course on processes and procedures. And it would be fair to say that despite legislative reform for our LGBTIQ community being, being included in our Labor manifesto, that there was not universal approval to me putting my member's bill in the ballot. Thankfully, the Honourable Parikura Horomia tackled those who were opposed in a manner that shook many into acquiescence. And so while my, my name is often associated with the passing of the bill, it would probably have never been realised without Parikura. It was during this journey that the debate around marriage equality was rooted in basic human rights principles. How could the state deny the rights of a group of people to enter into the state-recognised institution of marriage? While the deputy leader of the caucus at the time wanted more recognition of civil unions, I believe that advocacy for marriage equality was based on fundamental human rights and that civil unions became a stopgap measure because it was not, not clear that marriage would get over the line. When I expressed this view, I was told that this would be the end of my career and I would be on my own. The success in achieving marriage equality is not mine or the party's though. The lobby group, groups throughout the country, Legalise Love, Campaigns for Marriage Equality in various towns and city, our rainbow community and the commitment across parties in the House achieve that. And I share the collective parliamentary leadership formally with Kevin Haig and the Honourable To Henare. One highlight from that time was reflected in the action of Major Campbell Roberts. And I know that many of our community were deeply affected by the position the Salvation Army took on homosexual law reform. But during marriage equality, I had positive discussions with Campbell who advised me that they would take a neutral position on marriage equality. During the passage of the bill, the Salvation Army apologised to our rainbow community for the hurt occasioned by their stance during homosexual law reform. This leadership has contributed to the progression of the rights of rainbow peoples in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and it is much appreciated. Members' bills are an avenue that allow debate and discussion on issues that may not be part of the government's agenda, or if they are, may not be a priority for the respective minister. I have had the opportunity to provide a platform for these discussions through members' bills and the guidance of the Atua to influence the draws from the biscuit tin. <laughs> During my time, I have been able to raise issues around housing, period poverty, FGM, surrogacy, alcohol policies, early education, uh, revenge porn, safe zones and protection of journalist sources. And I have been blessed to have the opportunity to facilitate two private bills through the House that allow children to have their parents properly recorded on their birth certificate. And the Members' Bill process has allowed me to work with some wonderful people to ensure we are doing all we can to have legislation that achieves the outcomes we are seeking. It is a privilege to have Dame Margaret Sparrow here, along with Terry Bellamack, who have worked tirelessly for abortion law reform. And I am forever grateful to Professor Mark Hennigan, who provided invaluable advice on many issues, including end-of-life choice and surrogacy laws. 
The staff in the Parliamentary Council Office and the Office of the Clerk have always been willing to listen and find ways to practically reflect aspirations. One regret I have is that we have not as a party and as a government had the courage to confirm in our Constitution Act the status of Māori as the Indigenous people of Aotearoa New Zealand. I have tried on a number of occasions to put the bill in the ballot, but it did not get through caucus. For a fleeting moment when we came into government in 2017, there was talk of it being a government bill, but no minister agreed to that course of action. I was then able uh, to put it in the members' ballot, but was directed to withdraw it prior to the 2020 election. As discussions around he pua pua, co-governance and recognition of te tiriti o Waitangi become the focus of politicians and parties, having statutory recognition of Māori as tangata whenua and its first peoples would remove the propensity that allows people to ignore our reality as an Indigenous people that continue to suffer the scrooge of colonisation. Māori are not another ethnic group. In 2010, we signed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and it is time we took the most basic, basic of steps and recognised our status as Indigenous people in our Constitution Act. In my maiden speech in 2008, I spoke of two Labour Party principles that were of central interest to me as I entered this House. The first was Labour's commitment to Te Tiriti o Waitangi as the founding document of Aotearoa New Zealand, and the second was a commitment to human rights. Statutory acknowledgement of our status as First Peoples meets both those principles and is something I believe should be addressed sooner rather than later. It is that commitment to human rights that will be uppermost in my mind as I move into my new role as Ambassador for Gender Equality in the Pacific. I am grateful for the opportunity to continue work in an area that I am passionate about and to support this government's Pacific Resilience Strategy. I also welcome the opportunity to continue ag advocacy for LGBTIQ plus equality, both in the Pacific and internationally. I have been lucky to have the support of the Minister, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta, and the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Chris Seed, in appointing me to a role that will use the experiences I have had in order to promote greater representation of women in accordance with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I also want to thank the Honourable Margaret Wilson and Dame Marilyn Waring, two very special wahine who have always provided sound advice and guidance. My electorate office staff, Bill, Verena, Karen Brake, my support staff in Parliament, Mediana Rudi, Joe Pettit, Gina, Anasta Siadis, and Wendy Stevenson, uh, parliamentary staff, Jane McKenzie, Winton Holmes, and Wendy Hart, representing all the staff I've had the privilege to work with on various committees. The diplomatic community, Laura Clark, unfortunately at home with COVID, always so willing to engage on issues that maintain global peace and security. My friend, lawyer, and former colleague, the Honourable Christopher Finlayson. Having all your collective support has enabled me to continue to do my job. Finally, my love and gratitude to my whānau sitting in the Speaker's Gallery. <laughs> my mum, who carries my dad on her shoulders every day. Uncle Tai and Auntie Chris Taho, the Taho Hodges Fano, Cousin Charlotte, Severn and Joe, and all those representing my Ngāti Tuwharetō, Ngāti Hineuru, Waikato, and Ngāti Kuri Fano, my Ngāti Hine mentor and friend, via Moi Milne, my fam, Catherine Smith, and we know you will be watching Tina McCafferty, and my wife and partner in every sense of the word, word surrounded by her children, who we are so very proud of, Georgia and Thomas, who with Prudence Jane Tamati Kapua have taken every step with me on this journey. We have been an awesome team, and I know we will continue to support, nurture, and love one another. So while there have been obstacles to face and overcome, I leave knowing that I did what I could within those constraints. To use a sporting analogy, I left it all on the field. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.